So, recently I was a guest on a podcast, and unfortunately at the time of recording this audio, I don't know if that podcast episode is public, so I'm just gonna speak super vaguely. If the podcast is up by the time this video will be uploaded, then hey, I'm gonna go out there and leave a link in the description if you want to go ahead and listen to my guest appearance on whichever show that might have been. But, while I was on this podcast, I got asked a question towards the end before I departed, asking if I had a Vancouver Canucks-related hot take for the 2022-2023 NHL season. And my hot take on the show was that Andre Kuzmenko, newly acquired forward, highly touted UFA status player, and KHL superstar, would go out there in Vancouver and score 25 goals. Now, do I believe in my heart of hearts that's going to happen? Not sure. Hot takes exist for a reason, and I was kind of put on the spot, so I definitely don't want to go out there and make it seem like I'm going to be putting money down or anything for Kuzmenko to be getting 25 goals, but it kind of got me thinking, hey, I'd like to go out there and just make a regular old video about Andre Kuzmenko. Give my opinions on what this guy could be at the NHL level. Get your thoughts in the comment section below as well, because that definitely is one of the more redeeming parts of being able to make videos on YouTube, just seeing what the masses have to think about certain topics, and just try to explore what exactly is it the Canucks could see out of this first-year NHL player. Now, Andre Kuzmenko, if you need the rundown of the profile, which I don't think most people would, but just in case you're one of the few and far between who have never heard of this guy, he was a former Russian superstar in the Russian Hockey League. He's 26 years old, 5'11", 194 as a right-handed left-wing player, and he's signed a one-year, $950,000 contract with the Vancouver Canucks till 2023. Last season in the KHL for SKA St. Petersburg, Kuzmenko had 53 points in 45 games played and 20 goals as well. He was just under a point per game in the postseason, and he was one of the top producers in the entire league when it comes to overall points. He was second overall behind Vadim Shipachev, who had a very bad NHL tenure when he was here with Vegas, but Andre Kuzmenko was indeed there and he was doing his thing. He was super highly touted. You had so many teams going out there and trying to sign this guy to bring him over to the NHL next season, and the Vancouver Canucks ultimately won in a sweepstakes that included other teams like the Oilers, the Golden Knights, the Hurricanes, etc. Nowadays, you have yourselves this player who is in Vancouver, he is working out, he is doing things with other Vancouver Canucks-related talents like Ilya Mikheyev and Artur Silovs, they're doing practices in Burnaby, and you can see all the clips that are being publicized online of it. It's pretty cool just seeing the Canucks players doing hockey drills and all that jazz. But for Andre Kuzmenko heading into 2022-2023, it's really difficult to go out there and try to bet, predict... I guess these are the right words to use, right? Bet on or predict what he's going to be able to do with 110% certainty. Heck, it's uncertain as to whether or not a guy like Ilya Mikheyev, whom the Canucks signed this previous offseason as well, is going to produce too. Like, it's so difficult to try to predict how much any of these guys are going to produce, let alone somebody who hasn't even played an NHL game yet. Which is why, if I'm going to go out there and start labeling my perspective on a Kuzmenko 22-23 season, the range is going to be so vast. Like, the worst-case scenario with Andre Kuzmenko is we get ourselves another Vadim Shipachev situation, wherein he was a KHL superstar, he signed with Vegas, he was not given an opportunity because they didn't think he was good enough, and he just yeeted away after playing three games with the Vegas Golden Knights getting one goal in the process. Like, Shipachev was a terrible situation. Worst-case scenario over there for Andre Kuzmenko. And there was somewhat of a similar sort of recruit process that Shipachev had because this was a player coming off of the free agent market in the KHL who had 76 points in 50 games. He was a highly touted free agent as well. So the Vegas Golden Knights really did just fumble the bag with a guy that could be a very legit hockey talent in any market that he plays in, it's just he wasn't really given the opportunity to succeed in Vegas. Now, when it comes to the ceiling for Andre Kuzmenko and what he could be for Vancouver, you want to go over to the last Russian guy who signed a free agent contract and who was incredible coming over to North America? Artemi Panarin is the most recent example of somebody who was really, really, like, out of this world good. You could say Nikita Gusev had a good first season in the NHL too, and I won't discredit that, but Artemi Panarin went out there and won himself the Calder. 
Now, Panarin was in a different situation. He was playing with Patrick Kane. There was this entire nickname that Panera Bread was dubbed as the right-handed version of a Patrick Kane because Kane is a lefty, Panarin was a righty, and they fed off so well with each other, which is why Panarin had 77 points in 80 games in his first season. He won the Calder that year over Goss Spare and over Connor McDavid. Nowadays, Artemi Panarin is a 100-point caliber winger. He has not actually hit 100 points in the NHL yet, but the points per game in his previous few years kind of have that status of being a 100-point caliber season. He just hasn't hit it because he hasn't had the games played. But for Andrei Kuzmenko, it definitely does exist the possibility that he is this good as well. It's just... What is the likelihood of that actually coming to fruition here? I don't want to go out there and make it seem like it's going to be the most likely thing in the world, because where Panarin was playing with Patrick Kane, you're going to have to go out there and try to put Kuzmenko with like a Pedersen or something if you really want to try to replicate that level of offensive productivity. Now, this is where things get interesting, because if we go over to this Twitter thread by Jeff Patterson on August 31st, there is kind of a discussion happening about the wingers and the centers and the forwards in general on Vancouver. I heard Canucks Boudreau on 650 this morning talking again about his big three centers, so pretty clearly he's planning to start the camp that way. He can always load up with Miller and Pedersen together, but we're certainly expecting the team to roll out with three separate centers of their top guys on each of the three lines. So Miller, Pedersen, Bo. In some sort of an order like that, it's kind of difficult to try to think that one of those three is going to be a de facto third line center, but... This is the conversation that ensues after this tweet was made. Corey here replies saying, With the way the wings are and the center depth is, I don't really see any other way to do it and be successful. Run three scoring lines, presumably with the Horvat line taking on the tougher matchups, and a traditional fourth line. J. Pat replies, You could certainly stack the lotto line and run with a truly elite scoring line and let the chips fall from there, but that definitely exposes a hole at 3C and would not put third line wingers in the best position to succeed. I mean, yeah. You're going to have to have somebody on your third line there, whether or not that's a Mikheyev or a Kuzmenko or a Pearson or a Podkolzin. If any of those guys are playing with Dickinson, I don't really think they're going to do all too well, comparative to if they played with a guy like Bo Horvat, for example. Right, Corey says? By rolling with the big three down the middle, Kuzmenko and Mikheyev are guaranteed to having a very good center to start their NHL Canuck careers. You could make a pretty decent matchup line with Pearson, Horvat, and Mikheyev. Sure, but then you're rolling the dice with Kuzmenko and Podkolzin as top six scoring wingers from day one. Both have plenty to prove to fit that bill. Now, Podkolzin has himself an entirely other discussion that in which we talked about a few weeks ago, but for Andre Kuzmenko, if you really wanted to stack it up, stack up the talent, play this guy with a Miller or a Pedersen, and, I don't know, try to put him on that one power play. Like, move Brock Besser to power play two with Garland and see what Kuzmenko could do on the corner spot down low on the Miller side. There are a few opportunities that I think could definitely arise, especially when you acknowledge what it was that Kuzmenko did in the KHL that made him so lethal. You know how I just said that thing about Besser playing in the corner on the power play? Guess where Andre Kuzmenko loved to camp out on the power play for SKA St. Petersburg? That's right, he was a specialist in Gretzky's office behind the net. This is exactly the spot that if you wanted to go out there and say, hey, Kuzmenko, just go out there, do what it is that you're good at, Score your points, and the way that you scored points in the KHL, you put him there on the power play. Quinn Hughes, top of the umbrella, Petey on the right side, Bo in the middle, Miller on the left side, and you have Andre Kuzmenko down low, getting, let's say, every third pass behind the net, holds onto it a little bit, and then facilitates play back over to a Miller or a Petey, setting up a cross crease or something. You got a lot of points scoring from that area right there, and if the Vancouver Canucks and Bruce Boudreaux are interested in trying to replicate that sort of level of success in the NHL right away, they're going to go out there and try that out. Now, I'm not really too sure if that's guaranteed, but if it is, I mean, I would like to see Kuzmenko go out there and get all the opportunities and ice time and everything to actually do something in the NHL, but it does kind of beg the question as to where the rest of the scoring goes. Because if you move Brock Besser to power play two, Hopefully that's the boost the team needs to have a second power play that's actually competent. Like, I don't think I'd be getting too much flack if I said that the Canucks power play, or at least the second power play, has sucked for years now. Like, we haven't had a good, legit second power play unit in ages. And recently, with guys like Nate Schmidt and OEL and Garland, unfortunately, just hasn't been working recently, so... 
If you stack it up, you give Besser some opportunities there with a Pearson or with a Mikheyev, for example, I think there definitely could be some boosts happening to the power play if Kuzmenko is able to replicate the magic that he had. Maybe he goes out there and gets himself, let's say, 30 assists on the year. And maybe he gets 25 goals just dashing down the wing and sniping goals left, right, and center. Who really knows? I think as an absolute low, you could probably see Kuzmenko get no fewer than 15 points. Like, if he gets 7 goals and, like, eight assists, then okay, like, that's an absolutely bad season, but I don't think it's too out of the realm of possibility. But as for a ceiling, I mean, if this guy gets 20 goals and 20 assists for 40 points, I don't think that should be too surprising for anybody. I don't know. What I'm getting at here, though, is that there is a big range as to what could happen, good or bad. Talk in the comments about your thoughts about Kuzmenko and where you see his projection going for 22-23, and do you kind of agree with some of the things that I said here? Let me know your thoughts. I hope you enjoyed this video. And... Bye.